Thank you everyone for joining us for this webinar, Managing Lighting Industry Relationships and in Evolving Your Career, presented by Ethan Weber. My name is Laura Lawrence and I'm the Global Marketing Director at Harman. Just a few things before we get started. Everyone on the call is muted to keep down noise levels during the webinar. However, there is a Q&A function where you can submit questions to the presenter and he'll try to answer as many questions as possible at the end. This webinar is being recorded and the link will be made available a few days after this presentation. We do have a number of other webinars taking place over the next few months for audio, lighting, video, and control. And we'd like to encourage you to take a look at those different webinars in our learning session workshop series that can be found on pro.harman.com. We are adding new sessions weekly, so watch for those coming up on the calendar. And now I'd like to introduce you to Ethan Weber, the presenter for today's webinar. Ethan is a touring lighting designer, director, programmer, and technician. His design credits include Keith Richards, Green Day, my Chemical Romance, Lou Reed, Bob Dylan, Marilyn Manson, and Angels and Airwaves, among others. He has also been the lighting director for the Rolling Stones, U2, and Van Halen. Now I'll pass it to you, Ethan. Thanks, Laura. Hi, everyone. Sorry, I'm a little bit nervous, kind of pre, like uh, opening show jitters. Hopefully by the encore, I'll have settled in a little bit. Anyway, so my name's Ethan Weber, and I'm going to talk about the importance of relationships in this lighting world of ours. Relationships with bosses, with coworkers, with those working under us, and with vendors. We'll talk about how they can make or break a career and how to navigate the often confusing waters. My experience is almost entirely in the content industry, so I'll approach it from that angle, but with a few title changes, I think it's fairly analogous to film, TV, theater, and corporates. So starting with a loose analogy, I have three young kids who have recently started playing Little League Baseball. They all wanna have that bat in their hand and be the big hitter, but I keep telling them that fielding is just as important to their success. Same with lighting. It's not enough to be a great designer, programmer, crew chief, moving light tech, or electrician. Your relationships, like fielding, are an essential element in making it to the next level. I assume most who are tuning into this are already making a living in or are doing some sort of lighting already, but still may be helpful to talk about how we get started. So how did we get into it? Clubs have always been a great way to get a foot in the door. We start as a hand, show some interest, and become a lighting second, and eventually the resident designer. Local bands. Another fairly common end is to start by lighting local bands. Maybe start with a friend's band and either grow with them or make a name for yourself and branch out to others in local music. Schools, there's high school or college or the college route, working on concert committees or in the theater departments. College programs used to be almost exclusively geared towards theater, but more and more they're also adding a concert sidebar. Then there's uh, places like Full Sail, dedicated production schools that have been around for a few years now, and many people have gone from there into lighting careers. Stagehands, most many notables like Cosmo who directs ACDC and designs Aerosmith started out as stagehands. And then there's lighting companies. There are many who go straight to work at lighting companies. So with the exception of enrolling in a theater or college lighting program or going to a dedicated production school like Full Sail, the commonality between all these is that they're probably 80% relationship-based. It's through friends or acquaintances that we get our first step in the door. It's through friends that we find out their lighting or labor company exists and is hiring. A friend gets us in as a hand at a club or theater. Then we build relationships within that move us up the ladder. A musician friend hires us to light the band, which leads to jobs lighting other local bands. It's a friend that tells us the school needs people to help work its concerts, et cetera. If you've gotten your foot over the threshold, working in any of the places I just talked about, you're close to getting to the next step. Nothing of course is wrong with continuing on at a club, working as a hand or being a local lighting designer. But if you wanna start traveling and working on national or international tours, how do you do it? So there are exceptions to every rule. I think Fenton Williams started with Dave Matthews in the clubs and has been with them ever since. But I think the most common way to start traveling is to work for one of the bigger lighting companies. How does one go about finding and getting hired by one of the national or international companies? The internet, of course, is a great and easy source for finding the companies that are doing a lot of business. Look through the industry magazines. They'll always mention the tour vendors. 
If you go to shows, look at the road cases to see who the vendors are. If you're working in a club or a theater, pay attention to the companies that come in. Look at how well or poorly their shows put together. See what you think about their crew. Are they nice, professional, knowledgeable? Talk to the crew or LD, ask their opinion and get a reference. I was tour touring Japan a few years ago using a local lighting company. One of the crew, Yoshi Shinohara, came up and told me he wanted to work in the US or UK and asked for company names and contacts. I gave him names and email addresses then wrote letters letting my contacts know that he might be getting in touch and giving for what little it's worth my recommendation. Yoshi did his research, decided on which one he was interested in, flew himself to the US and spent a couple days in the warehouse auditioning. The company hired him and he's been touring the world for the past few years with Paul McCartney, Black Sabbath and Eric Clapton and many more. So do your research, keep your eyes open when working or going to shows and seek out people who can help you get in the door. It's been a few years since I started, so I reached out to Derek Bassan at Upstaging and Susie Castillo at PRG, both of them were nice enough to fill me in on their hiring practice and how one goes from the shop to doing shows. There are dozens of great lighting and production companies out there, but these two are pretty good to look at for our purposes. Both companies do a fair share of touring and corporates, but are pretty much at the opposite ends of the spectrum when it comes to their business models. Upstaging is more of a boutique production company, high quality product coming from a single location just outside Chicago. Years ago, they relied almost exclusively on homegrown talent, but in the past few years, they've grown exponentially and their hiring radius, radius encompasses most of the US, Canada, and as far away as Japan. PRG, by contrast, has 65 locations on five continents in 15 different countries. Not sure what their employment totals are, but must be well into the thousands. Upstage, upstaging hiring process is a little less formal and more varied. People send in resumes, they call in, they come as summer help, funneled in through nearby high schools and colleges. They fill out online application forms, friend of a friend, etc. Freelancers, according to Derek, usually come by word of mouth. An upstaging tour might go through a club or theater and a local lighting person or hand might express some interest and the contact may lead to a job. Derek said he did some festivals a while back and was so impressed by one of the other designers that he offered him a job. So who generally gets hired by upstaging? Someone with a relationship to a current employee or a trusted source. Resume references are usually checked. The students who come for the summer are recommended by their teachers or professors and the freelancers are recommended by LDs, production managers, stage managers, or upstaging crew members. PRG US, as it's grown, has had to tighten its hiring. They still often rely on friends of current employees to find new staff, but all are directed to the PRG's website where available positions and application forms are posted. The site also has a devoted freelance button that allows one to register to be considered for numerous positions. Both sections ask for references, and as with any job, if you have a known reference, and you have a better chance of being hired. Some of the bigger PRG offices also have internship programs that can often lead to full-time employment. Years ago, I was pulling a show out of CPL, one of PRG's predecessors. There were six full sale students who were spending their summer at Verilite. They would spend their days working in the Verilite shop, then come to our prep area and help us build. It didn't take long for us and the project manager to, to figure out who we could rely on. And it wasn't long before they were hired on. And I soon had one of them out on a one and a half year long worldwide stadium tour. So now you've gotten in with the lighting company. I've drawn a chart that gives us an idea of the flow at many lighting companies. There's of course no standard structure that companies follow, but I've seen more and more of them using a setup similar to this. Starting at the top, there's the owner or CEO if it's a publicly traded company. As the industry's grown, I've seen many owners having to take a step back from the shop floor. I'm sure many regional owners still participate in all areas of their business. And Dave Ridgeway from Nagarth probably spends as much time in the warehouse as he does in his office. But at many companies, shop staff will rarely see the owner or owners. In my shop days, there was much interaction with the owner, but he was making decisions about buying $40 car cans, not $10,000 moving lights. So I think it might've been easier to be involved with all that was going on. 
with owners having to spend more time dealing with bankers and business decisions and with more companies turning into full production companies offering video and maybe sound or fabrication as well. Many also have a director of lighting, someone who oversees the day-to-day -day operations and reports back to the owner. Unless the shop is huge, good chance you'll have some interaction with them. Below the owner and the director, I'm not sure that there's any clear cut hierarchy, but we'll go over the rest in some semblance of order, taking it from a job getting booked to it leaving the warehouse. Next in line are the account reps, the first to deal with incoming clients. They're usually the ones who bring in the work, bid on jobs and take care of all the preliminary discussions. Account reps at busy companies will often be handling a lot of jobs at once and need to continue booking other work. So to keep things from falling into cracks, once a job is booked and fixed your types and quantities are sorted out, they'll turn the job over to either a project manager or a crew chief. Somewhere in there too, the job will need to be crewed. Someone will need to select and book a crew chief and fill all the other positions. Some companies will have hundreds of people on the rosters and need to have one or more people keeping track of them. They have to know their availability, skill level, pay scale, their home city, et cetera. So going back to project managers, I think bigger companies tend toward using project managers. It help, helps out with gear allocation. I know when I was crew chiefing, I'd take enough spares to get me through any situation, which probably left the next crew barely enough equipment, pardon me, for their show. A good project manager will, will make sure you're taken care of without screwing other shows. Project managers can also liaise with the shop four person and possibly the different shop departments. So the crew chiefs can concentrate on looking after their crew and building their show instead of chasing down gear from around the warehouse. Many companies are also using a fair amount of freelancers. If the crew chief isn't a full-time employee, having a project manager who knows the gear and company standards is a huge help. Nice to be able to go to one person with all your questions. Most crew chiefs will take the information from the account rep or project manager, figure out how they'd like it to be built, figure cable lengths, DMX channeling, distros, rigging, trussing, et cetera. There are some companies whose project managers will figure out all the specifics to ensure things are done according to company standards. And again, to make sure just the right amount of gear goes out the door. But in my experience, it's usually the job of the crew chief. From the project manager, and our crew chief off flows through the shop for a person. They're the connection between the front office and the shop, making sure everything booked by the account handlers gets built and gets on trucks. In smaller companies, it's common for everyone to, except maybe the electronics and rigging departments to pitch in and help with all elements of the build. Larger companies usually have dedicated departments and dedicated staff, shop staff designed to those departments. Each department, electronics, rigging, moving lights, conventionals, cables, and special effects will probably have a head and staff that they oversee. Equipment lists separated by department will come from the project manager or crew chief to the shop four person, get distributed to the department heads who will have it pulled and delivered to a prep area for the crew chief and either his crew or shop staff to put together in the show form. So let's go back to our two companies to talk about what goes on once hired and how to go about moving up to whatever your desired goal is. Starting again with upstaging. Derek says that their goal when hiring people is to hopefully get them trained and out on shows. If you're coming in with little experience, your first stop is the cable and rigging departments. Good place for you to get an overview of what goes on in the shop and it gives the higher ups a chance to see your work ethic, how you get along with others and your skill level. There's a 30 day trial period to determine if you'll continue on at the company. But other than that, there's no timetable for getting out to do shows and tours. The end goal is for you to be well-rounded. So you have, have to work and become proficient in all departments before going out. The department heads give lots of feedback to Derek and his staff. And the speed you progress depends not only how quickly you master the department, but just as important, how hard you work how little you complain, and if you respect your bosses. Work hard and develop a good relationship with your department head and shop for a person and you'll move up quickly. Once you moved out through the different departments, you'll start helping to build shows, working with the touring and corporate crews. So by now you've developed a good relationship with the department heads, your shop mates and your four person. 
now it's to, time to develop one with the shop crews. Same as before, work hard, do as you're asked, don't complain and get along with others. Build a relationship with the crews and crew chiefs and you'll soon be asking to, and they'll soon be asking to have you on their jobs. And again, if you work hard, do as you're asked and don't complain while on shows, you'll soon develop a relationship with the account reps and company labor manager, which should keep you out doing shows. Depending on their level of experience, freelancers coming into upstaging probably won't need to go through each department, but will need to work with some established crew members to learn the upstaging way and for upstaging to get a feel for the freelancer and their abilities. And the same, if you're a freelancer, it's important to build relationship with the shop's management team and crew if you wanna work there in the future. Sorry. So moving on to PRG. PRG also uses the department method, but it sounds like one needs to be more proactive to mo move through the shop and get on the shows there. When hired, you're hired to work in a specific department, cable, moving lights, rigging, et cetera. Once you're in a department and train, the heads would prefer that you stay there to keep from having to hire and train someone else to fill your shoes if you move on. If you do want to move up and work in different departments or start doing shows, Susie suggested that you should seek out shop managers and discuss your goals with them. They can either suggest ways to get ahead or steer you towards someone who can help. You would also want to keep an eye on company job postings and apply for anything that looks interesting. As with upstaging and most, other, most all companies, the key to consistent work once you've joined PR show staff is again through your relationships. If you want to do concert tours, you need to build a relationship with Chuck LaRue, a PRG labor manager. He books all labor for their touring market. You should also develop a relationship with any of the account reps and crew chiefs. They have a lot of say and can request that Chuck put you on one of their shows. If you want to work on TV or corporate shows, you want to foster a relationship with Susie Castillo and any of the account reps who deal with those markets. Find ways to meet the account reps, crew chiefs, and labor managers. Let them know that you're interested in working for them. If you work hard, have a smile on your face and a friendly demeanor, you'll get noticed and be able to work your way up. Both Susie and Eric said they look for nice and friendly people. They say that anyone can be taught the technical aspects that they need to know, but you can't teach nice. So to recap, once you've gotten into like lighting company, make sure you build relationships with your coworkers. Important to show that you can get along with others as you'll often be in close quarters while out on jobs. Build relationships with your department heads and shop for people who will probably be instrumental in you taking the next step. Build relationships with the company's crew chiefs, project managers and account representatives, all of whom will have the ability to request you be hired on one of their jobs. And finally, Build a relationship with the labor manager or managers if the company has more than one. They're the ones who will be responsible for booking you on jobs. All these people will be looking for hard workers who are friendly, don't complain, work well with others, follow orders and instructions, and that they can trust not to screw up. It's bad for a company's image and expensive to fix if they send crew out that don't work. Most account reps will tell you one of the calls they dread the most is the one from a designer or production manager telling them someone on your crew isn't working out and needs to be replaced. Once you've built your relationships and they know you can be trusted to go out and do a good job, you'll work regularly and have a chance to move up the ladder. So we've done a great job in the shop, probably done some local shows or events to get used to working with stage hands and experience the pace and structure of load ins, shows and load outs. You're about to get the opportunity to go out on a tour. Let's go over the tour layout and what kind of relationships you'll need to foster out there. As with the company chart, this tour positions tree is a rough example. All tours are staffed differently and are very much dependent on the size and type of show it is. To keep the diagram semi-readable, I've left off positions that don't usually affect our status out there, security, accounting, promoter reps, et cetera. There are lots of similarities between this and the lighting company tree. The artist, band, and manager are like a company owner. If it's a small tour or lighting company, you might have a fair amount of contact with them. If it's a larger tour or company, you'll probably have minimal or no contact if you're a little lower crew position. Tour managers often like the lighting company director, though their duties can change depending on the size of the tour and the tour manager style. Their chief function is usually looking after the band, dealing with the band's travel, 
hotels, looking after any press they have to do, getting the band to and from the venue. There are also tours where the tour manager deals with budgets, books buses and trucks, and gets involved in vendor pricing. Again, all depends on the tour size and the tour manager. The production manager's job is also variable depending on the tour. Some production managers limit their abilities or limit their duties, sorry. That line again, some production managers limit their duties to a show day, a show's day-to-day -day logistics, advancing the production needs with local promoters, making sure the equipment gets from city to city, sorting out crew call times, making sure there are stage hands and catering at the venue, looking after loadings and loadouts, and looking after the show among many other things. On many tours, especially with a more experienced production manager, they will be the one to take the lighting scenic, video designs and sound layouts to vendors for bidding. They'll spec the crew numbers. They, with the help of their assistants, will book crew travel and hotels. You'll undoubtedly have a lot of contact with the production manager, like much like you will with a shop floor person. If a tour is big enough to have production assistants or coordinators, you'll also have a lot of dealings with them. They'll often handle plane travel and hotels and will be the intermediary between you and the runner if you need anything purchased on a show day. Never piss them off. Not only do they work closely with the production manager, but if they don't like you, you'll end up sitting in middle seats on airplanes and have rooms in the noisiest part of a hotel. Many tours, especially arena and stadium ones, will have more one or more stage managers. A theatrical stage manager generally calls cues during a show. A concert stage manager runs load-ins and load-outs. They'll get trucks in place and dump. They'll make sure you have stage hands. They'll let you know when stage hands need to break and when they'll be cut. They'll often get the band on stage and they'll do it all in reverse when the show's done. Having a good relationship with the manager, if you have any interaction and with the tour and production managers will not only make the tour much more enjoyable for you, but could also lead to work in the future. Managers are almost always involved in hiring the lighting and set designers, if that's your end goal. Even if they don't make the final decision, it's often them who gather up the candidates and present them to the band. Case in point, I did a Janet Jackson tour many years ago, starting off as crew chief and morphing into the lighting director. I got along very well with their manager and it led to designing Pink's first two tours and the Joe Cocker tour. Tour and production managers also have a large part in the hiring process. If you develop a good relationship with them, they'll undoubtedly request you the next time they use the company you're working for and possibly hire you or refer you to management if you've gone freelance and gotten into designing. Gotten many of my design and direction jobs as a result of my relationships with tour and especially production managers. So how do you achieve it? Same as with everything else, work hard, show up to work with a smile, don't complain and get along with people. I think one of the reasons I've gotten on well with production managers and have gotten many recommendations from them is because of my work ethic. Tour managers are the white collar management on a tour. Production managers are blue collar management. Put in long hours and get involved in the building and tear tearing down of a show. I think I earn their respect when I make myself part of the lighting crew, loading in and out with everyone. I also try to follow their guidelines when designing a show. If they tell me the lights have to fit the three, three trucks and can only cost a certain amount, I make sure to fit in three trucks and bring it in, in budget. Many of the relationships I've built with them over the years have turned into jobs or at least job offers at some point. I used to talking so much. So I placed the design team, lighting, set, video, and sound below the production manager, but on some tours, they're either on equal footing or above production and tour managers. I won't go into sound, scenic, or video other than to suggest that it's a good idea to know them and get along with them. I think the ice has melted a little, but for many years, it was always supposed to be animosity between the sound, lighting, and video crews. I got that caught up in that my first few years, but soon realized we're all in it together and better to get along and help each other out. Relationships with sound engineers have resulted in at least two job off, jobs offered to me in the last few years. One was from an engineer who took a job as a production manager, the other from a monitor engineer who became a Claire Brothers account rep 
and was asked by a manager to recommend a lighting designer. So be nice to everyone, you never know. The top three on the lighting branch are probably the most important for your early success and chances to climb up the ladder. The lighting designer may or may not be out on tour. If only out for rehearsals and a few key shows, make sure you meet them and, and help out if they need anything. Most designers have an interest in knowing the people are gonna be looking after their show. Don't go overboard. Rehearsals are stressful and real, rarely enough time for a lot of small talk, but good if they at least know who you are. If the designer stays with the show, don't suck up, but be the one who answers the radio if they need help with anything. Be the stand-in if they need someone to focus on. If you have a desire to move up to lighting direction or design, spend time with them, learn from them. All this will lead to work in the future, again, either with the lighting company or as a freelancer, if you wanna direct and design. I often get contacted asking for director or design recommendations. If it's a small tour, I'll often suggest someone that I know is trying to get their foot in the door, someone that has impressed me with their work as a crew member. The same goes for lighting directors, although you'll probably have enough time to get to know them and build a relationship. Again, be the one to answer the radio if the director needs anything done. Put in the extra effort and it will pay off. I've had many crewmates over the years that I really enjoy working with and will always request, but there are a handful that have really stuck out and I've made a point to get them hired on for long tours. Important also to make sure that it's genuine. I don't want someone to put the, in the extra effort because I'm the designer or director. I want them to do it because that's who they are and how they work. And usually it becomes pretty self-evident very quickly. And always volunteer to run the opening acts if they need someone, even if they don't have money to pay you. It's a big plus if I've seen that you have the desire to run a show every chance you get, even if it means skipping meal, eating on the go, or putting a lot of effort in for no extra money. The lighting crew chief will be your direct boss and the one most important to your early success or hopefully not early demise. If you're new to touring, a good crew chief will give you jobs suited to your skill level and give guidance whenever possible especially if you've shown up on time with a good attitude and are willing to work hard without complaining. It's in everyone's best interest if you're successful. As long as you develop a good relationship with your crew chief, they'll do whatever they can to make sure you succeed. They're also the conduit back to the account rep, project manager, and labor manager. If you do well, they'll all know it. If you have a bad attitude and suck, they'll know that too. Most crew bosses like to develop a team and keep them together from tour to tour. As you gain their trust, you'll be given more and more responsibility. And at some point, the account rep or labor manager will pull you out and give you a tour of your own to crew chief. The rest of the lighting crew will at first be your superiors when you first start, but also your coworkers. Get along with them, learn from them, and be friends with them. It'll make your work days and off days much more enjoyable. If you do work hard and they're successful, there are many avenues you can go down. If you're happy to be part of the general lighting crew, bolting trusts together and flying them, hanging lights, et cetera, and you're good at it and have a good attitude, you'll always have work, either at the company you've been working for or another if you build up connections over the years. I can't speak for the rest of the world, but in Europe, the dimmer dim distro position is more of a career job than in the US. In the US, people tend to treat it as a stepping stone to another position like crew chiefing. In Europe, most of the dimmer people I've had on tour are true boffins with great knowledge of electronics and electrics. In my eyes, the dimmer person is the most important crew member during showtime. The crew chief and a great dimmer person are always at the top of my list when requesting crew for a tour. Moving light teching is another step up the ladder and someone that both directors and crew chiefs will often request. So if you wanna do anything with design, directing, direction, or programming, you generally need to leave the nest and go freelance or start a design company or join an established firm. There's some acts that will use in-house designers. My first two jobs went or through the company I was working for, but I think it's fairly rare. and can be very, very limiting. Freelancing is almost entirely based on relationships. The more people you know and the better reputation you have, the more work you'll get. Lighting programming and directing are two freelancing paths you can take that are very much relationship-based. Designers want or need someone they have a good rapport with. There's a huge amount of trust that needs to develop between a designer and the program who will be taking the designer's ideas and transforming them into stage looks. 
And there needs to be a huge amount of trust between a designer and their director, a person who will be taking their show on the road. Designers and their longtime programmers will often develop their own shorthand language and almost instinctively know what the other's thinking. The relationship is invaluable to both. The designer gets the show they want without having to compromise or waste a lot of time trying to describe moves or looks that are often indescribable. The programmer gets work and also some added creativity because the designer doesn't feel the need to lead them by the hand step by step. I usually like programming my own shows because I enjoy the process, but have used programmers in the past, especially at festivals if there's a console I'm not familiar with. Results have always been best when I've been able to develop a rapport or re relationship with the programmer. As a director, you very much want to develop relationships with designers. Most important that the designer knows you well enough to trust that you're gonna look after their show and make it as good as it can be every night. They have to trust that if the band adds songs to the set list or changes the old ones, you'll be able to program something that looks good and is done in a style similar to theirs. They have to trust that if the lighting rig needs to be altered to fit in a venue, you'll make the right decision. And they have to trust that if the show goes into festivals, you'll be able to adapt and replicate your touring system. It's important too for designer and director to have a good relationship with their crew chief and rigger. The director is responsible for replicating the art night after night. The crew chief and rigger are responsible for replicating the physical day after day. As a designer or director, you will whenever possible request a crew chief you know and trust. Designers and directors also, of course, need to build relationships with bands and man band managers. The director, because there will be times during the tour when lighting issues need to be discussed, our job is to make sure the artist feels comfortable on stage and that they're seen in the best possible light. Having a rapport with managers and bands will help put them at ease. Designers need to sell their ideas to the band, need to have a sense of what the artist's vision is and how they wanna be portrayed on stage. The artist needs to know the designer and have faith that's what, that what's being presented on paper or computer will translate to real life. If you look at the top designers, they all have long-standing relationships with some of the bigger artists. These artists rarely even look to anyone else for a design proposal because they feel so comfortable with them. Patrick Woodruff has designed every Rolling Stones tour since 1982, ACDC for almost 30 years, Genesis and Phil Collins for many, many years. Willie Williams has designed everything U2 has done since 1982. For many years, Prince wouldn't tour if Roy Bennett wasn't available. And if you look at his resume, you'll see the same artists repeating time after time, Paul McCartney, Lady Gaga, Nine Inch Nails, et cetera. Steve Kahn has been with Billy Joel since 1972, almost 50 years. Relationships with the artists have made for some very successful careers. So others to know. Oops. Other people that are very good to know and foster friendships with are vendors, distributors, and manufacturers. Our vendors, are companies that we rent equipment from. If you're a freelancer, having contacts at as many vendors as possible can only help. Account reps, project managers, labor managers, and other crew from these companies will be the ones who will call and offer you work or who you can call and ask for work. Most companies, especially in the busy summer months, will need an additional crew. The more vendors you have relationships with, the more chances you have of finding work. You'll probably have your favorites to work with, but never close the door on others. Often band managers, tour managers, and production managers will have long-standing relationship with an account rep and ask for designer or director recommendations. I've gotten many jobs thanks to account reps. Distributors. Distributors as well are, are very good to know. In the US and UK, it's through ACT and Ambersphere that grandma console trading and support are offered. Distributors know about new equipment before any of us. If I get a call from Phil Norfolk at Ambersphere telling me about a new fixture that's come out and he re recommends it, good chance I'll try it out. We have a long-standing relationship and I trust that he'll give me his honest opinion. 
Philip knew that the stones were going out a few years ago and called to tell us about the point or pointy, however you want to pronounce it. He was enthusiastic about it. So we tried it and got several years, some great looks and a few burnt curtains out of him. Recently, we're switching some lights out on a pre-existing show. I wanted to borrow some of the new lights to do some cloning and programming before we went out into a, a very short rehearsal period. A couple of emails and Philip had a few lights making their way across the ocean for me. For crew chief, it's also good to have contacts at the distributor ships. Good for console and fixture support and often helpful not to have to go through your shop, but to go straight to the source. Manufacturers. Manufacturers are the companies that make and sell the products we use. Very good for crew chiefs and moving light techs to have contacts at all the major manufacturers. When out on a tour, it's many times easier and better to be able to call the manufacturer directly to help solve fixture issues. Less chance of things falling through the cracks or being misinterpreted. For designers and directors, we like to have a trusted rep, Brad Schiller, read his new book that we can talk to or email at all the major manufacturers. Helpful when you look, when looking for a certain type of fixture to be able to call and get their suggestions and opinions. They're also very accommodating about setting up local demos to see their new fixtures. If you can't make it to any of the trade shows or would rather see the lights and play with the consoles in a calmer environment. Let's talk briefly about how to lose jobs and possibly ruin your career through relationships, how to screw it all up. Ours is a very forgiving business. I know many people who consistently get fired but keep finding work elsewhere. Infractions. Some common infractions are consistently missing bus calls or showing up late, not showing up at all. I've actually had this happen a few times. Consistently letting the night before affect your work the next day. No one's expecting us to be saintly, but the work part is still the reason we're out there. Do your job. On the stadium tour, we had a crew member who spent part of his day up in the air, 60 feet, far out of our eyesight. We thought he was up there working, but turns out he had conned a carpenter into doing his job and was seen off in the distance strolling idly while everyone else was working. I think he was gone the next next week. Don't make stupid mistakes and check your work. I've had it and check your work. I've had a stimmer person blow up about three thousand dollars worth of ACL bulbs because he didn't check that a stage hand he had plug in in his. He didn't check that the stage hand he had plug in his feeder had done it right. I've seen a vertical truss that was hanging over the audience brought down at the end of the night and found that only one of the four bolts had put, been put in and the one was loose. A lot of what we can do is dangerous and costly if not done right. That person was also sent home a couple of days later. Get rid of any illegal substances before you go over a border and double check that you have. I had a crew member who had a joint in his pillowcase they'd forgotten about. They held up our buses at the Canadian border for six hours while they searched every bus and everybody. It cost the tour about $90,000 in union overtime. And all the rest of us had to work through the night to the next morning to get the show up and ready. If you wanna fight, do it on your own time, not while working. I've seen one fist fight on a tour I was, I was on. And then there was the famous Sade fight where one crew member attacked another on a bus with a shackle attached to the end of the span set. Don't be negative and unfriendly all the time. It might not get you fired, but it'll definitely not get you hired back. An unpleasant crew member can bring everyone down. There are plenty more ways to get sent home or not asked back, but no need to go into all of them. Most of these, except for the felony assault with a shackle, will probably only get you a temporary, if any, suspension from work, but they will definitely keep you from progressing on to the next level. So what does it take to do enough damage that your career is severely affected and you have trouble finding work? I know of a few ex examples of people who are doing well, but destroyed relationships and burned bridges badly enough to ruin their careers. One fairly well-known designer was asked to do a project for a longtime client. 
the client said there wasn't a lot of money in it and couldn't pay the de designer's normal fee. Designer refused to budge and has not worked for the artist since. He did continue to work after, but never on the same scale as before and much less frequently. Ego and unpleasantness. There was a programmer in the early days of moving light programmer, programming who was very sought after. He was fast, knowledgeable, and had a good eye, but he was an asshole to those he felt were beneath them, which was pretty much everyone. Designers would put up with it because of his talent, but as more and more programmers cropped up, his work rapidly came to an end. His ego got the best of him and he destroyed his work relationships. And from what I've heard, has barely worked since. And personal contact, conduct. There was a gentleman on one of my lighting crews whose work and attitude were always good, but had a tendency to get into trouble on most days off. Can't really go into specifics, but though he was allowed to finish the tour, the company never hired him again. He showed up on tour a few years later, driving a truck for a production manager who decided to give him a second chance. Halfway between two cities, he got out of the truck, threw the keys to someone at the truck stop, gave the truck stop the production number and told him to call the production manager and tell him where the truck was. He was to say he hasn't worked this, in this industry since. Uh, there are several other examples I witnessed or heard through legend. The common thread between the others all seems to revolve around ego, not respecting one's place and treating others poorly, burning relationships and work because of it. As a way of kind of recapping everything, I'll do a quick rundown of my career, of how my career has unfolded and how most everything is related to relationships I've had over the years. Another unsolicited plug. I grew up in St. Louis, Missouri. My best friend took a trip, trip to the East Coast to look at colleges during our senior year of high school. He was most impressed by one in Providence, Rhode Island. So the main quad was a beautiful grassy area and everyone was just hanging out enjoying the sun. Seemed like a good place. So we both applied and got in. While there, I joined the concert committee working as a stagehand under Abby Rosen, who was the school's production manager. I also played drums in a little bar band with some school friends that I met in random ways and random places. After Abby graduated, I became the production manager. We used to book shows through Mark Wagner at Metropolitan Productions in the New York, New Jersey area. All of us in the band graduated in 1984 and decided to move down to New York City to become rock stars. I needed a job and thought it would be a good idea to try finding work as a stagehand. I called Mark Wagner at Metropolitan. He suggested I call Abby, who was working at C Factor out in Queens. At the time, they were one of the bigger US lighting companies. I called Abby at C Factor. She happened to be off tour and in the shop that day. She talked to the shop four person who asked me to come in right away. And I worked there for almost 10 years. For a quick recap of my recap, my high school friend got me to college in Providence. Because of that, I met Abby and Mark and a few bandmates. My relationship with the bandmates got me to New York. My relationship with Mark and Abby got me a job at C Factor. While at C Factor, I met a lot of people. Bob C's best friend was Michael Ahern, then production manager for the Rolling Stones. We did a lot of work for him and I got along very well with him. I also did shows with Patrick Woodruff and toured with Al Santos, Bob Dylan's production manager, among others. Bob C thought I might have an eye, so he put me forward when Lou's management called looking for an LD. I designed a few tours and a lot of one-offs while at C Factor. I went freelance in the early 90s. I spent a lot of time lighting Lou Reed and Bob Dylan, among others. I heard that Keith Richards was doing a solo tour and knew that Michael Ahern was putting it together. I called Michael. He said I was too late that he had already hired someone to design it, but would I be willing to come out as crew chief? I said, I just wanted to do the tour. So it was fine with whatever position Michael was offering. We did a month or so in Europe and the LD was fired for doing too many drugs with one of the band members, not Keith, and not focusing on his job. 
Michael offered the job to me and I took it and we designed the show. Keith's manager was very happy with the job I did and we became friends. The Stones announced they were gonna, going out a year or so after I finished with Keith. I called Keith's manager and told her I'd like to do the tour. She, she suggested I write or call Patrick who I'd known from my Steve Factor days. I was out on Dylan at the time. Al Santos claims to have written my letter to Patrick expressing my interest, but I'm pretty sure I wrote it and he just proofread it. Anyway, Jane, Keith's manager called Patrick and told him it would be nice if I were involved, someone to make sure Keith's lighting was looked after. I didn't know the whole hog one and Patrick didn't want the tour to be a training ground. So he offered me the crew chief position instead. I said, yes, I just wanna be part of the tour. The next tour came around and Patrick asked if I'd be the lighting director and run one of the two consoles. Of course I said yes and have been running the shows ever since. Another recap, through C Factor and my relationship with Bob C, I met Michael Ahern, Patrick Woodruff and Al Santos among many others. That led to Keith Richards and relationship with Keith's manager that led to touring with the Stones for the past 26 years. Keith's first LD on the tour I did, on the other hand, is an example of what not to do. He initially had a good relationship with Keith and his manager, but didn't do his job and was let go. Oh, sorry. During my time with the Stones, I got to know Jake Berry and Opie Skurseth and Winky from Tate and Willie Williams, who designed the video content for one of the Stones tours. Through Opie, I was referred to Marilyn Manson's manager. I did a few rather interesting tours with him. Winky got a call from my chemical romances manager. He suggested they hire me. That led to two tours and meeting Greg Dean who got me a job designing Green Day. Willie Williams needed a job, needed, sorry, Willie Williams needed a, a director for U2's 360 tour. Jake was the production manager. I spent three years lighting the huge spaceship that was 360. There are many more examples of interconnections that have resulted in my current resume. Probably a little backwards in this day and age, but I've never had a website. I've always been able to rely on relationships that I've made over the years to keep me in work. So far, I've been very lucky. To sum up, the moral of this webinar is that to move up in your lighting career, work hard, impress those you work with, foster relationships, and enjoy the winding path that takes you on. Thank you for listening. Brad, I think, do we have time? Oops, I can't hear you. Oops. There we go. Yeah, we can't hear Laura. Um, How are we doing for time? Yeah, we, there's some questions. I know she has any. Uh, Sorry, my... guys, my audio wasn't working. Can you hear me now? Yes. Yeah. Perfect. Okay, we do have some questions. Um, the first one is asking, how long does it generally take for a person to move from working in a shop to being on the road? So it all, all depends. I know in the, um, in the old CPL Verilite shop in the UK, they required someone to spend two times or two years in the shop if they came in new. Um, upstaging, talking to Derek, he said, there's no timeline at all. He said, if you get everything quickly and move through all the different departments, it's, it's fairly quick. The main thing is that, that the shops wanna make sure you're well-versed in everything you need to know out there. So no real answer, it depends on how hard you work and how quickly you, you pick up on everything. I would say probably anywhere from I mean, when I, when I started at C-Factor, it was different. It was just the, the um, park hand days, but I think within a month I was out, out on tour. Not necessarily a superstar, but I was still, still out working. But I, I would say, you know, probably anywhere between half a year and a couple of years. Okay, the next question okay. is asking, what are good ways to meet designers if you are not yet working on major shows? Um, you know, you can befriend them on Facebook. You can find there, if they have a website, you can email them. If you go to a show, 
after the show, go up and talk to him. I mean, I, um, I was doing Green Day and I was befriended by, by someone. He was, a, a, I think he was a, probably a freshman in high school or maybe, maybe a little under that. We had a mutual friend. I thought, okay, I must know this person. Turns out he was a, a, a student and they started, um, they started messing, messaging me. And, you know, most, most of us like helping people out. So since then, uh, we've, had, we've met for lunch a few times, him, his father and me, they've come out to um, a couple stone shows. They've, they've come the day before kind of seen the process they've stayed through the night and they've kind of gotten um they've gotten a feel for for how things work i guess if that makes sense so you know most people are approachable especially if you've gotten to a certain level like i said you know the, the people who are really successful are are generally nice and do want to help out but i'm one of the biggest ways is talk to people after a show you know so just go up to the council and, and introduce yourself all right, next question is asking, what is the worst thing you can do that will destroy your relationships? Um, God, hard to say really. I mean, all, all those things I mentioned, most of it is, is, um, is not, doing, not doing the job, not doing your work, doing it poorly, not showing up to work, generally being an asshole. I mean, I mean, if somebody, if, if I'm on, on a tour and I don't like a crew member because they're bringing everybody down, whatever, you, I generally let them finish the tour, but then we'll make sure never to hire them again. And, you know, if it's, it's not, I don't, I don't go back to the, to the project manager, the, the account rep usually and say, well, this guy was horrible, but, but they know, they generally know. So a, a lot of it's about attitude. I think is the biggest thing. Just like I say, you know, you, if you work hard, you're pleasant to be around, then you'll, you'll keep getting hired. Okay, next question is asking, do you go out of your way to have your name recognized to further grow your relationships? Do you hand out cards or try to get in industry press? No, I, I don't because I'm a little shy and I'm embarrassed by it all. I, I'm, I know people who do, and, they, and they've done very well by it. I had, um, years ago, I, I, a friend of mine made some business cards, but I've never never once handed one out. It's more, when, once you've been in it long enough, again, you know, if you're a friendly person, you meet people, you make sure you know them, and, and word gets around. It's a very, very small business. So there are many ways to do it, but but generally just uh, meeting people, knowing them. Uh, I don't know, did that answer the question? Yep, I think so. Yeah. Okay, so yeah, for me, no, it's, it's more like, and, and word of mouth, it travels, people know, you know, I, you'll meet somebody and you'll feel like you should know them because you've heard their name for so many years because it's such a small, small business. So people know if you do a good job, people know you. All right. Next question is asking, how is your relationship with Patrick Woodrow? Are you programming the show and he is giving you the basic looks of every song? No, I mean, we're at the point, Patrick, I've been there so long. Dave Hill used to program the shows and now uh, the last, and then I'd run them and, and, um, and as we went along, I, I tweaked the shows or if they're new songs, I'd always do the programming. Um, I've been there so long, I know what Patrick likes. And Patrick at this point is, he's, he is the show designer, show director. He trusts that I'm gonna light it as he would want it lit. You know, before the tour, he'll t we'll talk and, and he'll tell me what direction he wants to go in and then you know, he'll focus a lot on the set, on the video now. He's the one, he spent a lot of time with the band. And then once we get out to rehearsals or, or pre-production, I'll program everything. 
Terry Cook from his office might sit out with me and we'll, we'll, we'll kind of talk things over. And then Patrick will come out a few, few times and, and we'll go over things and look at, look at what we have in the board and make comments. But generally, I know what he's, I know what he's looking for. You know, again, there's that symbiosis, symbiotic relationship between the a director, a programmer, and a designer once they've been working together for so long. All right, we have a couple more questions. Um, the next one is asking, what would you suggest as some steps to take during this time to get yourself armed and ready in regards to employability when things kick back up to a full send? I think I've been guilty of doing absolutely nothing, although I did borrow a, um, a grandma three from upstaging that I'm, I'm hoping to, to learn, but um, I've got three young kids that I've been trying to deal with their e-schooling. I would, I would say, um, you know, there are all kinds of training courses, learn the consoles, you know, everybody has a, um, a computer, computer version, learn the consoles, um, learn vector works, learn drawing, you know, s stay connected. I know designers who are constantly designing who will have 10 different designs drawn up. For me, I can't, I can't think that far in the future, but if you have the time, yeah, just, just continue learning, you know, maybe strike up some relationships. It's a good time for, if you can find people's email addresses or face, Facebook pages, get in touch with them. You know, most designers have time now. If you want to strike up a relationship, get in touch with them now. Say, look, you know, I, I admire your work, et cetera, et cetera. I mean, I, um, the other night I was, I turned on um, the David Byrne special on HBO and, and thought the lighting looks great. Look, searched the uh, designer, it was Rob Sinclair, who I know, and, and I emailed him, said, you know, I, I think your show looks great. I think um, if you wanna email somebody, tell them you like their work, whatever, that makes sense. We have another question. What's the biggest difference between theatrical and concert and how big is the transition from one to another? I think in the early days, there was a huge difference. You know, theatrical was, was all Lico's, park hands. We started getting into moving lights and, and trussing all the um, theatrical people made fun of us, but they gradually saw that maybe it's, maybe, uh, maybe we had the right idea. So you'll see a lot more um, moving lights in shows, obviously, you know, they're, they're everywhere, but you'll, you'll see bigger lighting effects in, um, in some of the theatrical shows now. And you also see a lot more programmers uh, switching over, switching back and forth between because it's now, they're also in, in the old days, there were um, dedicated theater boards, dedicated rock boards. Now every board does everything. So it is, there's a lot more interaction between the two. I mean, when I first started, you know, people would talk about theater. I'm like, oh, I'm not really interested in making the sunrise. I wanna make a thousand pretty pictures a night, but now you know, they're very similar. There's a lot of lighting effects in theatrical now and you have to light the talent. So it, I think they're becoming more and more similar. Okay. All right, wonderful. It looks like that was the last question that came in. Right. Ethan, thank you so much for presenting. You were wonderful. Yeah. Thank you very much for having me. Absolutely. And thank you everyone for attending. Um, Thanks, as everyone. always, if you're interested in future sessions, you can view the upcoming calendar on um, pro.harman.com. And there are a number of lighting sessions next week. So be sure to register for those. Ethan, thank you again. And have thank a you. Thanks, everyone. Thanks. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye. Thanks. Bye.